Once again, everyone, I'm sorry if this video is late, but as always, there was a Jubby the Hong video on the same day, and I have to have my priorities straight, and the swivel man takes priority. Before I actually get started, I want to talk about, uh, well, I don't want to talk about anything, I'm just going to say that my friend Kitty Kurishima is doing something very important. I'm going to play the video for you now. As most of you know by now, Australia is experiencing widespread bushfires. So much has been lost already, and bushfire season is nowhere near over. I've already donated, but I want to do more, so I'm going to offer an incentive to help raise more money. If you can send me proof of a donation of over $10 towards the cause, I will draw you or your C or even your favorite animal in this drawing. I hope to fill the page as a way to thank everyone for helping out. I have many friends in Australia, and my heart goes out to all the people and animals affected by the wildfires. Please consider donating to the Australian Red Cross or directly to fire brigades in affected areas. Donate to wildlife organizations if you prefer, or donate to help families displaced by the fires. There are so many ways you can help, and everything counts. Thank you for continuing to support Australia, and let's not forget to thank the brave individuals risking their lives to fight the fires. If you're watching this on YouTube, here is my Twitter handle if you want to get in contact and DM me your proof of donation. Thank you again, and... Let's help Australia. <laughs> and I hope you actually stayed to watch that. It was very, very important to me and to her and to a lot of people, honestly, um, to help as much as possible with the dilemma that we're trying to help with. Um, but now that's over, let's do the fun complaining about the cartoons. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this episode, so I'm going to have to take it piece by piece and see what my conclusion is as we go. First, Watts vs. Ironwood. Very fun fight. I'm a little disappointed how few gadgets Watts ended up having. He really just had shields and they used as a platform one time and a gun and his control of the arena was pretty much limited to just changing the gravity and the occasional elemental thing. He didn't make the most of what he had access to, but the fight was fun and the fact that it was very different to the norm by being primarily a gunfight and a gunfight where the ammo count matters, mind you, that's very important for Ruby. And the fact that when it got up close, it was actually just a straight up brawl instead of some over choreographed child playing with action figure scuffle made it a lot more entertaining. You know what? The whole sequence is like four or five minutes long, so I can't even complain that it's too short a fight. It was very well done. I like it. I mean, we don't see what happens to Watts, but that's okay. I'm assuming what happened was his mustache took off and Ironwood threw his body into the magma, but he didn't realize that Watts' life force is actually encompassed in his mustache. So his mustache just grew in new Watts elsewhere, and Watts was fine. That's what happened. Otherwise, I'll be a bit annoyed that Watts and Pietro never encounter each other. The Tyrion Kalos fight I also surprisingly enjoyed. While Tyrion does manage to stand his ground for a bit, it's very obvious from the start he's outmatched, and I'm just surprised Crow didn't spontaneously combust and go into alcohol withdrawals the moment the fight started. You know, just considering Crow's recent track record of accomplishments. The rest of the episode is infighting, and on one hand, I like that there's some kind of a moral dilemma, that, but there's one big thing I can't get over. It took us seven volumes, seven years of this show, for the main antagonist to actually meet the protagonist. So it took us seven years to Ruby to actually react to her mother's death. I know there were going to be a lot of people who were hit hard by the scene of Ruby crying over her mum's death, but I was laughing my ass off. Not because I'm heartless, or because I don't know what it's like to lose people, I do, and it's not like I never cried over an, an, a death in a show, or an anime, or a, a TV series, or anything. But what happened was, in this case, it took so long for Ruby to react like an actual human being to her mother's death, I was laughing at the fact that Ruby just... Her mother's brought up and just instant, instantly goes to crying, Mom? Oh no! Uncle Crow! In fact, that was my complaint about making some of this grandiose moment in Volume 6. If Ruby is never shown to care, then most people who aren't predisposed to eating up all the shit the show spits out aren't going to care. The solution is just not bringing Summer up again. Uh, it's not like she has any actual narrative weight to the series. The only important thing about her is that her vagina puked Ruby out. That is the only important part of her character. The solution was not backpedaling and trying to make it seem like Ruby actually gives a damn, because either it makes it seem like Ruby gave a damn this whole time and the show didn't think Ruby's feelings and personality were important, or that Ruby suddenly remembered that her mother is dead and she's like, oh yeah, mom's dead. Ruby as a character is so schizophrenic that I don't know why I expect her to be consistent at this point. But you know what? At least someone crying over the mother's death makes sense. At least I can look at it and go, at the very least, I understand why Ruby would be sad her mother's dead. 
She's not fucking Yang. Phrasing! Yang is all like, Yeah, we told Robin, we broke your trust and disproved our loyalty, lied about what happened with Robin too, but we did it, so it's like, okay, we had a reason. And I was like, yeah, I lied. I did it because... And then Yang's like, you just said that to Lama once. And just look at her face, the tone of her voice as well. She's just like judging Ironwood. Come the fuck on. I'm still annoyed Yang broke his trust and that hasn't exploded in her face yet. Oh, hey, look, Ironwood no longer trusts them. I wonder why. Am I supposed to side with the heroes? I mean, I know why. It's not going to be terribly surprising if they beat the Aesop, stop Ironwood, save everyone somehow, stop Cinder and Neo, because they don't need any smelly adults with their logical thinking and making tough choices when they can save everyone with naivety. I would immensely prefer, if they were going down this route, Ruby took down the Aesops with their team, stopped Ironwood, and then everything goes to hell, and everyone they've been trying to save dies, or at least a large majority. More people die because of Ruby's actions. That's something you don't see enough of in shows that try to be realistic and have more dilemma in mass consequences. Even a show I really like, such as Fate's Stand Out of Limited Blade Works, has this problem. You're supposed to support Shiro because the act of trying to save everyone is his thing. But then you're supposed to understand Archer because he's like, oh, trying to save everyone is really stupid, you can't do that. But then, that stupidity of that logic, of the saving everyone logic, never backfires on Shiro. He always has the support of others, or himself, or dumb luck. And that really makes it hard to understand Archer's point of view. It makes Archer's thought process completely senseless because it makes it seem like in this, in the Nasuverse, trying to save everyone does work. Because Shiro never fails to accomplish it, really, unless he physically fails and even then he's like well i physically couldn't have done it so why should i be too broken up and i'm going to be sad for a bit but then i'm going to get over it really quickly because i got other people to save but the difference is there i can understand that doing the same thing over and over again like archer did probably pissed him off probably broke him so at least if the logic doesn't make sense eh. but here it no at least in fate zero when these moral issues are brought up, there are very real consequences, both for the protagonist and the overall narrative of the entire franchise. Kiritsuka's actions are paramount to Fate Stay Night and Fate Hollow Ataraxia occurring. Fate Hollow Ataraxia is the sequel to Fate Stay Night, the visual novel. It's, it's a thing. It's also really confusing because it follows all three routes of the original game, so it's really weird. I want to see Ruby do something like this, something where the actions born of ignorance and naivety cause something catastrophic to occur. Because you're putting children in command of a worldwide dilemma involving a millennia-old super-immortal, what do you expect's gonna happen? Remember the fall of Beacon? Something like that You could, they could do. You don't need to show everyone dying, and all the people who are like, the fall of Beacon doesn't matter anymore because Penny's alive again. Shut up! <laughs> Penny's death was the catalyst for the fall, but not the only thing it did. Penny being back doesn't undo Pyrrha's death, or Ruby finding the Silver Eyes, unfortunately. Cinder getting the full maiden power, Ozpin dying and reincarnating into Oscar, unfortunately. Weiss learning how to summon, Roman dying, unfortunately. The communications towers collapsing, and Port and Ublek losing relevance in the series, unfortunately. So I know Rooster Teeth can orchestrate an event like that again, and the thing is that it'd feel more natural here. In a volume like this, where the hard choices and military regime and moral conundrums are key deciding factors in a lot of the discussion, no matter how badly written, it is more natural that it ends in disaster or sacrificing a lot of people for the sake of more people, a very utilitarian standpoint. It feels more natural to me and possibly some of my viewers, I don't speak for them, so if you're a viewer and you disagree, that's fine. If either Ironwood comes out on top and a lot of people die so more people than died can be saved, or Team Ruby stop Ironwood and almost everything is lost due to their actions, and they have to face those actions in the next volume, and it helps their characters grow and develop as they realize they can't save everyone, and they can't just rely on their own naive outlook. Sometimes they need to rely on others and not break their trust, something that actually makes them have to develop as characters, as opposed to Team Ruby stopping Ironwood and Cinder and Neo, and Salem's actions, everything's saved, everyone's okay guys, the only people who died are the ones that were not our fault, so it's okay. That's just unrealistic, and Ruby has been taking strides to be more realistic, especially in volumes 5 and 6, where characters almost never use their semblances and auras broken seconds to make it seem like this is real things, but at least, if you, at least they understand in this volume that having superpowers doesn't immediately make a series unrealistic in the sense of the writing. Obviously, it's unrealistic in that characters have superpowers, but the characters can still be realistic, and the actions that occur 
and the consequences of events in the series can still be in a realistic matter. The difference is that they have superpowers. So you can still be realistic while having super... I mean, look at freaking Daredevil. For season one, the only season I watched. Um, it's really good, though. It's realistic while having a blind ninja beating up hordes of thugs on his own. Yeah. At the very least, the best I can give this episode is that I enjoyed both of the fights. I liked Iron Wooden Ruby actually arguing face-to-face once, although he might he might have brought up the fact that Robin um, knew about the towers beforehand, before he told her. Uh, but he, what he doesn't bring up is the fact that Oscar went in him and told him Ruby's lie outside of briefly mentioning it for one thing. And I'm rambling now. I'm staring at this fly that's just walking around my software. Go away. I like that Salem finally met Ruby, and I like the hook of the Team Ruby vs. the Aesops. Even though these fully trained, fully experienced, significantly more powerful and intelligent and better a team of fighters with perfectly complementary abilities and weaknesses, they're definitely going to lose this team of not fully trained, half ass consistently failing group of idiots. Oh, Brian, it was a very strong offensive on Sakura's part, but unfortunately, her opponent is very dumb. 